Okay. I think that we're live. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Super. So welcome. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. It's a real honor to be here today moderating a panel that's really going to dig into some of the most critical cross-cutting issues of our time. So, you know, broadly speaking, this panel will be using some of the core principles, um, the sort of the core principles of the state sustainable development goal number three, which focuses on health and well-being, you know, to, and we're going to look at the risks and opportunities on the on the horizon in this health space uh, as they uh, as they're associated with the SDG three. And so, a lot of the benchmarks for success that we've seen around this SDG, you know, improving healthcare access, innovative treatments and technologies, bolstering our our ability. Uh, to respond to both chronic and infectious disease outbreaks. You know, these are really at the front of mind for a lot of scientists and policymakers uh, as they consider the evolving COVID-19 landscape and beyond. You know, but and these these emergencies that we're these emergencies that we're seeing right now, the pandemic uh, environment that we're in uh, are obviously quite disruptive. You know, it's the reason why we're all having this conversation over a computer and not in person. But there are also opportunities. There are opportunities for investment. There are opportunities for innovation. Uh, you know, which is what this you know esteemed panel will be focusing on today. We're going to be hearing from a group with a really deep background in healthcare technology and biotech and public health. They have worked on these issues in low, medium, and high resource environments around the world. Uh, and you know, and the global perspective is going to inform our discussion around the challenges and opportunities in this unique moment in time. Uh, around systemic issues that can foster a more efficient and pro, you know productive environment for innovation, investment, and you know approval. Uh, you know, and so in the disaster response world, there's a saying that in these moments we can sometimes fall into the trap of um, planning for the last disaster, so to speak. Uh, so we'll also be you know I think we're also going to discuss the risks around you know this new landscape and ways in which we can make sure that you know improvements that we see today in the healthcare space don't come at the expense of some of the long-standing prog progress we have seen across the world on a number of other health issues, many of them obviously very pertinent to uh, sustainable development goal number three. Uh, now, just for some quick housekeeping, in the interest of time, I won't be going too deep into the speaker bios. Uh, those, those should be available via the speaker profiles within this uh, the Run the World video conferencing app. Each speaker will be speaking for around five minutes uh, with hopefully some opportunities for some uh, Q&A in between and after their presentations. So with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to our first speaker. Pam Rondawa is the chief executive officer and founder of Empirico Corporation, which is a biotech firm focusing on drug discovery and point of care diagnostics in the healthcare space. Pam? Thank you, Scott, for such a kind introduction and, and laying out the framework for our panel. Uh, it is such a privilege and honor to uh, participate in this panel with uh, everybody in with an expertise in, in their specific areas. Um, as you mentioned, the SDG3 is to ensure um, healthy lives and promote well-being for all ages. Um, <clears throat> for everyone. Um, so there are like 13 targets, um, including the end of epidemic uh, of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and other communicable and non-communicable diseases. Um, all UN members uh, stated that they agreed to work towards achieving these goals by 2030. Uh, but you may remember that uh, about 40 years ago, 134 countries uh, pledged uh, for healthy lives for all uh, by the year 2000. And, and as we've seen that they failed to deliver on that pledge, um, today at least 400 million people have no access to basic medical care. Um, so this is a real, real challenge for everyone. Um, you know, World Health Organization uh, estimated that approximately 50% of the, the world population, about 3.9 billion people, um, don't have the adequate healthcare services. And, and, and they estimate about that 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty in the low to middle income com countries because of the out of pocket cost that they have to endure and 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 that's a, that's another big challenge their share of you know out of pocket is is, is about 41% compared to the, the upper income countries about 22%. And so again, you know, that gap exists because of the uh, income level between the low income countries and, and the higher income countries. And um, also the, the percentage of the healthcare spending uh, 
from the government is much larger, um, you know, in, in high income countries versus the low income countries. Um, and, and, you know, that's like, for example, you know, there's a, uh, if you look at the per capita, uh, spending of, of the upper income countries about 70 times higher. So we can only understand that the weaknesses of the system are highlighted by not just not creating the effective system, but also, you know, lack of uh, investment. And and what we have seen because of the recent pandemic, we've seen the accurate, you know, diagnostics, uh, you know, are one of the most expensive in the overall the spectrum of healthcare. And, uh, you know, having the, uh, you know, uh, uh, logistical barriers also exist for the for the diagnostics. So I think that 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 poses uh, another challenge is it's almost like the weakest link uh, in the, in the whole spectrum of our care. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, have, we, we've seen that in, in, you know, large gap existing in the diagnosis of AIDS, you know, um, diabetes, hepatitis C, um, and, uh, tuberculosis, uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. And, and that exists actually both, uh, across, uh, you know, upper income countries and the low income countries um, it, it is it exists in both both of them and 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 if you see sort of the overall picture you know the world health organization uh, they released their first uh, essential medication uh, list in 1977 but they didn't release uh, the the list uh, essential list for diagnostics until 2018 so we can see sort of the pattern of 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 where we are today you know, because of because of many things that we all could have done and, and, and really didn't pursue to that uh, with, with the ambition that we needed to have. You know, uh, current pandemic, COVID-19, really exposed the weakness in the, in the public health system across the globe, uh, which underscored the importance of a, a rapid, you know, affordable access to accurate uh, diagnostics in primary and specialty settings. Um, you know, World Health Organization estimates that um, only 1% of the primary care clinics in, um, in low to middle income countries have the basic basic necessity uh, of diagnostic, uh, uh, you know, capacity of the diagnostics. And, and so, uh, you know, we made significant progress in the, in the cancer diagnostic. But, but if you look at the sub-Sahara, um, you know, uh, 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 sub-Sahara Africa, um, you see that uh, they have like approximately 10% of of the uh, capacity you know coverage for the basic healthcare and diagnostics so i think this is a this is a a, a very limiting uh in terms of us not being able to provide the early intervention um and treatment for for the patients that's needed to keep them you know healthy and productive and, and improving the quality of life. So I think to set this stage for, uh, for, for, you know, this discussion, you know, to achieve these, these, these goals, uh, we need a real comprehensive uh, approach, a very thoughtful approach, you know, that requires us to building a strong public health infrastructure globally. Uh, because we saw this COVID-19 across the globe. Um, we, we sort of got Cut off, off of guard. And, and this was again, decades and decades of neglect and uh, neglect of, you know, not making those investments. So I think we need to build a strong infrastructure, uh, globally and, uh, including the care delivery system, the surveillance and monitoring and a strong regulatory system, because that's a very key to make sure that the, the medicines have high efficacy and safety and, and people are monitored over time and, and we are bringing the quality uh, of of te uh, quality technologies uh, to to market and to these populations, you know, this really requires a sustainable, you know, innovation, major public and private investments, and collaborations, you know, across countries and regions. You know, we need to have newer. Uh, and, and more improved R&D and business models for therapeutics, for diagnostics, devices, um, and digital health and vaccines, um, and, and that, that, that can make the care more accessible and affordable. And, and also, you know, 
we can scale these technologies and, and we can implement them anywhere because implementation in Europe or United States of a technology is very different than, you know, uh, in, in a village of India or, or China or, or some of the other uh, the countries. So, so we need to establish, you know, the public and private partnerships to build this capacity, the high quality capacity for advanced technologies and solutions and promote the innovation uh, and new models for technology transfer and manufacturing systems uh, 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 and, and system-wide planning at the local level. So you can develop technologies in, um, in a more advanced uh, areas, but, but they need to be able to function um, at the local level. And that's very important. Um, you know, we need to build multi-tiered, connected, integrated healthcare and laboratory systems so we can properly diagnose and treat patients. You know, the financing system needs to be more sustainable and sufficiently flexible um, so it can adapt to changes in the disease prevalence, the microbial patterns, resistance patterns, and emerging diagnostics and, and, and new treatment. So, you know, we can have sort of flexible, you know, models for investments that allows us for for, for continued sustained invest, uh, uh, innovation. You know, over the four, 40 years, global challenges such as HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, influenza, MARSARS, and recent COVID-19 have demonstrated that the interconnectedness of global healthcare system is how important that is. So not making the adequate investment in the healthcare infrastructure, you know, have posed major health and financial burden. And we have a real opportunity now to collaborate and strengthen the healthcare system across the world. Thanks so much for that, Pam. Super helpful and incredible sort of, uh, uh, you laid out really kind of what we're talking about here in an incredible way. I, I was wondering if you could give us a sense from your perspective, your expertise, what do you see are some of the real opportunities? What are the things specifically in the areas that you're working on that you see optimism for, that you do see the opportunity for bridging this kind of low, medium, and high resource uh, healthcare environments? Yeah, and, and, and this is not a, a sales pitch, but just I want to explain a little bit about the work we're doing. Um, our work is we have two platforms. We have a drug discovery platform, and it's a, it's a chemical compound that mimics the cytochrome P450, so we can actually... Uh, drug metabolism toxicity in vitro. And an idea of this technology is to really rapidly looking at the existing drugs or failed drugs and looking at where the repurposing of these drugs can be new indications and, and how we can actually some of the drugs that are that are more toxic, like tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, can we make them safer? So that's our, our one of the platforms. But what the second platform is really is the personalized diagnostics at home or at point of care. That's where I see that there will be a major shift, as we have seen with COVID-19, that, that that everybody struggled through, that, you know, going to, you know, hospital or facility getting the test done, and then not having the adequate uh, test, um, we have not been prepared for that. And, and so what we are working on is, and we've been working on several years before, you know, COVID, uh, it's really creating a, an integrated system um, that has multiple instruments and, and biochips um, so that can assess the effectiveness of drugs um, so mass spectra, for example, miniaturized mass spectra, and also uh, a biochip that can do the, the immuno, immunoassay and clinical chemistry. And then there's a DNA RNA chip uh, that can do the pathogen sort of analysis and the, and the molecular diagnostics. And, and this particular uh, system is, is a quite heavy duty system. We've spent a number of years and we have partnered with a major institution. I am not at the liberty of naming today, but, um, and, and, Basically, it's in a collaboration. Uh, it's a joint venture with a major institute to develop this, and and that would be uh, that would allow the diagnostics actually to be at affordable and at home, uh, where physicians can can through telemedicine diagnose patients. Great, thank you so much. Uh, that was you know super helpful, and I think now we're going to shift to a, a view from Europe and a in in a, a conversation around a presentation around operating in different types of resource settings. We're, we're going to hear from uh, UC Mata, uh, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Buddy Healthcare. Uh, UC, take it away. Yes, thanks, thanks, Scott. Um, and Pam, I have to say, extremely good 
speech in now in the beginning of this this uh, this group. Uh, I you definitely covered the points that that I also want to cover from a little bit different angle. Um, maybe before I start my own 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 story and my own key points, just quickly telling what we what we do and why I'm here. So I'm CEO and founder of Body Healthcare Company, providing a care coordination pl- platform to automate and digitalize care pathways in in secondary healthcare and hospitals. Uh, we have quite broad ex- experience in in digital health like we cover 70 percent of all the hospitals in finland with our solution in addition to that having having a few university hospitals as a customer in germany and also some some clinics in in uk and i'm working together with nhs uh in addition to that we were recently working also with a couple of global medical devices device companies and farmers so i'm i'm really looking from this tech, tech point of view from from europe and then when thinking about uh, especially SGD three goal number eight like access to access to quality essential healthcare services. Uh, uh, COVID was definitely one of the turning points for the whole mission. Uh, as as I, I've seen, like digital health and telemedicine solutions implemented heavily all around the world. Uh, and like my personal experience, for example, that our own inbound volumes have tripled uh, during the last six months. So there is a heavy uh, heavy need for for new kind of kind of solutions uh um interesting pam you raised the topic of point of care diagnosis uh i i was about to tell about the point of care a little bit different angle so uh, what, what i see now now recently for example hospitals and healthcare organizations implementing implementing a lot of uh point of care solutions which which typically are video meetings and and appointments and of course uh, under under covid it's it's really necessary to have have such uh, such technologies in use in order to ensure the safety of the patient and and hospital staff uh, on on the other hand what i have heard uh, hospitals telling is that uh, as one of the aims of to deploy uh, digital solution is it solutions is to reduce the cost of care i actually see that uh, video appointments doesn't really um, reduce the cost of care as it still requires exactly the same num- um, number of doctors, nurses taking care of the patients. And in fact, patients who are having a digital appointment, they typically are not that well prepared for the actual appointment that they would be if the hospital would be in hospital settings. So that actually may require a lot of much more resources on the hospital side. Uh, but on the other hand, what I see is that that's definitely something that we have needed for for digital health to have a really push to to implement new new technologies and and uh, and and the point of uh, and, and talking about the diagnosis of point of care i think that another important factor here to consider is that uh to whom we actually design new solutions and new del- ways to deliver healthcare, because I see still a majority of the innovators uh, are focusing about the specific challenge. They want to solve the challenge that they are, they are specially interested in themselves. But typically, we see that uh, when 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 a challenge uh, challenge is solved, they the innovators doesn't think about that much about the care personnel or patient and where's the motivation for the patient. And and now here, for example, point of care diagnosis, there's definitely a motivation for the patient to do a diagnosis. But still at the moment when talking about the digital health, majority of the solutions are some kind of symptom tracking or uh, collecting data. And the main use case from hospital point of view is just to collect the data. And that's not the motivator for a patient or a consumer to use such technologies. They may use it one day or one week, but if they have to use one a solution for one month or one year, and all, and only only thing they get from the solution is actually the report data, uh, it's not meaningful, and 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 patients will stop or consumers will stop using that. Uh, and I think that that leads to us to the next topic, which is uh, innovation, and and. Uh, uh, from my perspective, too, too often I hear hospitals developing their own things with the public money, especially here in Europe. And in, in my point of view, like uh, every single innovation project actually slows down the real innovation with the year. So if, for example, governments uh, give hospitals the money to do the in the case innovation or uh, or set up innovation projects, hospital start, hospitals start first actually thinking that how 
uh, how we could create more work for our people, uh, how we could spend this ourselves, and how could we innovate? And and like in 95% of the time, the solution would be in the market already by a private company. And that is how I want to also challenge all the all the hospitals and research organizations that do the collaboration with the private side because the solution is is already there. And, and that is what we need in order to deploy new things. And 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 under this uh, UN SGD three goal, I see that it's really important. We also uh, can get the solutions into use. And although one would one would argue that in the US and Europe we don't need digital solutions that much that people would need in in Africa or Asia, which is the fact. But we also know that uh, we need first to deploy solutions here and to prove that they work in order to actually get that process copied and, and improved and, and, and to really get savings and, and the better healthcare in, in, in the developing countries. Uh, and and uh, also when talking about the in innovation, so uh, integrated health, uh, which is basically a collaboration, is really important also on, on that side. And I see, I see that the integrated integrated health should, should should happen on a national level but also on the cross border level and that is that I see being a role of the research organizations uh, or, or the hospitals they don't they shouldn't uh, implement or innovate uh, mobile care solutions or point of care uh, treatment technologies they should actually innovate together how to exchange data across than across the borders because they have all the capabilities to do that which is actually which really uh, private companies can't do and i think that a really good driver here for example and really good example country for this is uh, germany uh, and instead of uh, sharing money to hospitals to set up their own innovation projects they have actually uh, last year they set up set up the new uh, Digital Health Act, which, uh, which actually enables a reimbursement model for digital uh, health apps. Uh, so that helps drive, that drives uh, single doctors who prescribe new technologies for the patient. And now last week, German also announced that they have budgeted another 3 billion for digitalization for, for hospitals. And, and really hospitals have to spend that money to deploy new digital tools. And this is, I think, that the, one of the best examples I've seen here, how to really move forward with the, with the digital, health, digital health and not only calling it being an innovation or being a future. This is how you made it in, in, in practice. Super. Thank you so much. Uh, I just, in the interest of time, I'm going to move um, to the next speaker, and then, I, and then I think it's possible that we'll have uh, some more space for some Q and A at the end. I think, depending on how many of the panelists uh, we finally are able to connect. Uh, so it's now my honor to uh, to uh, introduce Anne Huang. Uh, she's the she's going to give us a view from the U.S. Uh, she's the co-founder of Sofragen Medical. Uh, she's been working on a, a number of innovative technologies and diagnostics for COVID and other illnesses. And uh, An, take it away. Um, thank you for the opportunity to um, share my perspective today. So this is really uh, relevant to my day job because our technology basis uh, is focused around taking a technology that was originally developed um, and innovated in a uh, low to medium um, income countries and taking that technology silk, so clothing silk into medicine. On the side, I also work um, for uh, various um, projects in, in, in the recent COVID pandemic. And so for today, I, I thought it was uh, would be interesting to um, speak a little bit more on Pam's comment regarding um, the need for um, regulatory agencies to find new ways to work with technology developers to achieve the UN's SDG goal on number three. So despite the global perception of U.S. responses to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, there's a couple of silver linings um, that surfaces, one of which is that the pandemic has paved ways for new innovative collaborations between policymakers, academic research, and private sectors. Um, so today I'd like to share my perspective on how these collaborations, specifically the U.S. FDA's adaptive approaches to reviewing technology innovation during the pandemic and how that impacts our uh, goal number three. Um, while, you know, we're not out of the woods with this pandemic yet, 
we've learned that with enough capital and prioritizations and alignment, we can challenge the traditional research development timeline. So uh, as a recap, if you guys remember, SARS-CoV-2 surfaced in the scientific community in the early to uh, 2020 and even perhaps even a couple months prior to that. And then in March, the WHO declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic. Um, what is really um, fascinating and, 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 and eye-opening for a, a scientist like myself is that later that month in March, FDA authorized the first point-of-care diagnostics for SARS-CoV-2. And then if you fast forward to today, October 2020, six months later, we have four vaccines that are in phase three clinical trials and over a dozen of other candidates to follow. So just to give you some um, a perspective on these unprecedented achievements, these tasks, and I'm sure like, you know, Pam and other members of the board can attest, would traditionally take about 10 years for vaccine development, now has, has somehow shrunk into one year of development. Traditionally, like what Pam has alluded to, for a diagnostic technology to be developed, it takes about two to five years of, of a lot of money and resources to, to get to market. Today, it took less than a month. And all of that, right, reaffirms that if we have the right capital and, and the right alignment in place, we can achieve what we thought was not achievable. While a, a lot of those uh, achievements were definitely, you know, um, credited to the, the developers and people working together, a part of that um, achievement, I think, in part was attributed to the U.S. But with, again, I'm giving the perspective of within the U.S., but um, in the U.S. attributed to F F our FDA's adaptive and cooperative interactions with uh, innovators. In the past, um, my experience with FDA has been, you know, you work on a plan, you send a message to FDA, and you wait for almost a year of interactions to get some guidance on how to move forward. What FDA has done differently in this pandemic is they develop a very innovative and interactive approach where there, for example, in diagnostics, there's a weekly town hall meeting where developers are able to call into a live session to ask questions and obtain feedback. And in response, instead of taking years and decades of clinical data to make a decision on policy, FDA is now adapting, right, and making new guidelines and changes within matters of weeks, which is pretty unprecedented. Today, we have in the diagnostics world almost three to 400 different uh, technology platforms that FDA is reviewing for commercial use. So that, to me, is an example of how uh, agencies, regulatory agencies should work with developers to come up with new technologies to address goal three. The other silver lining, which I'll quickly go through in the interest of time, is that this pandemic, while it is, you know, horrible for the, the, the economy and, and health of, of the world, it, the silver lining behind it is that it has shed new lights on research for the research community in, in a field that was formerly neglected, such as HIV, TB, malaria. As a, a scientist with a background in malaria and TB research, again, Pam, you're in that space. You know it's very difficult to find funding in that space. You rely on, on nonprofit institution, WHO, NIH. But now in this pandemic, the skill sets that were developed by these communities, how to develop technology that fits in traditionally resource limited settings, right, where malaria, TB and AIDS are predominantly present, such as developing a diagnostic that requires no electricity, limited capital, limited talent, right? Uh, reading data to, to interpret data very easily and very quickly, where it's super dusty and not controlled environment. These are, the, are very difficult restrictions to me with very limited fundings and capital to, 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 um, to, to, to meet these t technical innovation challenges. However, when the pandemic arrived, these were the same criteria that FDA put forward for developing COVID diagnostics that are easy for patients to use at home without a physician in, in their presence. And with, you know, that can scale to a level that, you know, uh, millions or hundreds of millions of, of um, residents can, can access. So in, in summary, while the, the pandemic is, 
you know, bad, there's some silver linings that we can learn from. Uh, m- most of that has been, you know, how do we get an agency to work together with uh, with uh, um, developers to come up with new and innovative technology that is affordable and, and, and also serve as a reminder that while diseases such as AIDS, TB, and malaria doesn't affect the, the U.S. today, if we don't pay attention and invest in it, it can have, you know, it as an um, individual disease can impact us at, at a global um, scale. And I'll stop there. Super. Yeah, that was uh, incredibly helpful. I, I think I now I, you know, I have a question for you and also the rest of the panelists, you know, just uh, to piggyback on what you were saying. And you know, I think that historically, at least over the last few decades, this, the, the pandemic preparedness and response community has been sort of plagued by a uh, panic and then do nothing uh, sort of environment. You know, there's lots of attention, lots of money, lots of real promise around innovative approaches, you know, and then the, the, the broader, you know, community, the political community, the policy community, even the public health community moves on, the funding starts to dry up. And, you know, and then, you know, and then you see a sort of a lot of the, the more interesting uh, pathways start to kind of get a little bit slower. You know, what, what do you, how, how do you see the sort of the future post uh, SARS-CoV-2 in that context? Do you think that the these new approaches, both in the U.S. and Europe and around the world, do you think we're going to start to see much more longstanding commitments and more sort of uh, sort of more permanent systems change around recognizing the the risk here and 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 what are some of the sort of the the medium term benefits of that as we you know so as we as we think about the post coronavirus environment. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then I, I invite the panel to to comment. But from my perspective, I don't see big pharma. Uh, um, I, I don't think they're going to change their investment thesis anytime soon. Right? I don't think anyone's going to start dumping money into finding the next cure for TBAs or HIV anytime soon. However, I, I think this pandemic has shed lights on how, at least in the U.S., how we respond, our, our habits, right? If we have the flu, I think we might be more likely to social distance and more likely to start wearing a mask at the level of federal funding. I think there should be more um, keen and an awareness to funding for, you know, infectious diseases where predominantly it wasn't very um, open from an in, uh, from a startup investment seeding perspective. I think investors might be more open to investing into life science startup companies that traditionally, you know, like a TB diagnostic company that traditionally would have a hard time finding venture capitalist money. So I'm curious to hear what the panel uh, perspective on that as well. Yeah, uh, you or Pam, please yeah, jump in. Um, you know, excellent summary uh, um, on uh, about the, the COVID journey that we all been. Um, I think that my perspective is that we are going to see the new R&D models that are not going to cost two point some billion dollars per drug. I think we're going to see that. We have seen that, that how many of right now we have like dozens of of uh, therapeutics in the pipeline. We have, you know, major vaccines in the pipeline, diagnostics. We've never heard of this before. And not to mention heavy investment has taken place from governments that's a that's a really uh, major difference. Um, you know, we've never seen, for example, in the U.S., we have a warp speed. Uh, you know, the, the the group that was established to really scale these vaccines as they come along. So when they are ready and approved, you know, we already have a stockpile to be distributed. You know, the whole supply supply chain issue is all, also addressed. That has never happened before. We have never had that. You are in phase two or phase one. And you already are scaling. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't have that. So the investments were made by the government, which, you know, it's not really possible by the private sector to do it in that manner. It may never happen in that manner, but I do think that the investments from governments are going to increase. I do think that the pharmaceutical industry, biotech industry and other, uh, um, uh, in, uh sub industries within the life sciences, uh, they are going to explore new models, new business models and new, uh, uh, you know, new R and D models. That that are going to make these technologies more more affordable because you really need to build these technologies that can be then transported to 
areas that are, you know, can't afford those expensive, uh, whether they're diagnostics or, or, or vaccines or medicines and or, or even telehealth solutions. Um, so you need to develop them with mind that it will go into a rugged environment, for example. They may not have a proper storage. Uh, the, the cost, you know, the price will be a fraction. So I, I do think that those models will emerge as we move along. And I think that would be uh, really fantastic for our, for our industry uh, because it's long overdue. Uh, and I think the prevention is going to be a focus as well. Uh, because that that is uh, uh, something that um, uh, you know we haven't seen really great technologies in that space. So I have a hope. Great, uh, and you see, please. Yeah, I, I definitely have have hope also for for digital health that the investments in, in in that will will raise all over the world. Uh, definitely, good point from Pam is in is that uh, the cost that we can charge or what we have to charge, for example, in Europe, that uh, will, will be the fraction in, in, in Asia or Africa, if, and, and hopefully we can get our solutions down, down there as, as well. And I think that this is, this is part of the global responsibility from, uh, from, uh, from, from the Europe and US to, to, to develop solutions and bring bring those solutions also to Africa and Asia, and, and not to charge that much as uh, that you could do in, in in our own country. So, and I think that that's that's the way that we can also do as as as, as companies to to help help developing countries. Uh, and interesting points I, I that uh, and 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 Pam told about uh, investments in drug 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 and uh, for example vaccine development. Uh, definitely, definitely agree with them on, on that side as well. And uh, unfortunately, I, I won't see such 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 investments uh, done done on on a digital health space that much. But but anyway, I, I see that uh, that will there will be a like a na- native need for the solutions and, and those will be paid by, by hospitals and, and, and providers and payers in the end of the day. Great. I, so I have another question. It's a, it's a big picture question. And I think, you know, all of you should feel free to jump in with your perspectives. But I think, you know, 2020 is a very sort of interesting moment in time. I think there's a lot of uh, flux in the international cooperation environment. I'm wondering what you think the role is of, you know, supranational multilateral institutions um, in kind of fostering some of this innovation. I know that, you know, from my perspective in the U.S., it's been a real point of contention around the relationships with the U.N., relationships with the WHO. I think in the in Europe, there's a different environment where, first of all, you have the European Union, which, Union, which is itself, you know, a, a supranational entity, which, um, has a sort of uh, evolving role in this outbreak and will likely sort of, I think, you know, reassess the its posture in a, you know, post-COVID world. I'm just wondering, you know, what are the opportunities? What are, you know, what are the challenges that we're going to see post-COVID with uh, in an environment where global cooperation, I think, is still not, or, you know, not, there's not a sort of strong, you know, universal commitment to it, uh, but there is this, you know, growing recognition that obviously, you know, to use the prior phrase that microbes don't respect borders, that infection threats are in fact global. Uh, and a lot of these transnational issues really do require uh, global coordination and response. So I'm just interested in hearing all of your perspectives on the near future uh, and some of the risks and opportunities there. Yeah, I, I can comment on that a little bit. I completely agree with you. Like virus um, don't understand political borders and don't respect it. But, but if you look at you know, the um, the successes or, or hopefully um, efforts, at least, in vaccine development and diagnostic uh, development, right, specifically for COVID, what you see is a global collaboration that that isn't really represented at a political level, right? So you see, for an example, in the vaccine development, you know, that the leading candidates, two from the U.S., one from China, and, and another one from, from the U.K., right, those are it doesn't speak to the, I would say, tension between these geographical territory, but from a um, innovations perspective, the, these you know territories are definitely working together, right? Leveraging very similar data set, a uh, scientific data set 
if you see that same pattern in diagnostic as well, where some of the earlier um, diagnostics came out of the U.S., out of China, and now there's there's platforms everywhere around the world, again, leveraging um, data that was published within the scientific community and scientific platform. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Ann because, you know, if you, in a, in a private sector, these relationships already occur because they are mutually beneficial. Uh, I think in, in, a, in a public sector, if you take foundations and uh, sort of a nonprofit institutions, NGO, that collaboration does occur and probably it's going to be strengthened. Then we have a next level, which is more the governments and the support of larger institutes like World Health Organizations and so forth. Um, to some degree, I think that the reassessment of how those priorities uh, would be established and implemented uh, probably needed to happen. And I do think after all said and done, we probably need a multi-layer approach to address, you know, a lot of these, not just the pandemics, but also epidemics. And, and that to me is after all said and done, uh, we will start to see that through, you know, because every country is going to recognize the need for that. So I think those collaborations will start to happen. Um, the investments that, you know, we U.S. have have stepped sort of aside uh, in in some of the areas. I think that, that will come back. I, I really do believe that will come back because it is necessary that we continue to invest um, in organizations uh, and private sectors uh, to continue this type of innovation to address the need. I mean, if you look at Gates Foundation, I mean, just the one you know, organization have done such an incredible work to eradicate polio, for example. And it can be done. So we know that there are examples that it can be done. Um, so yeah, I, I, agree. I, am I agree with you, what, what you, what you said from technical, technical point of view and, or, or the digital health point of view, what, what, I, what, I, what I see here and what has to happen after the COVID crisis is that now, now we've seen under COVID, for example, like uh, dozens of countries have developed their own applications for uh, infection tracking and, 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 and such, and that's not sustainable. And I, I, I believe and I hope and I believe that organizations and private companies will start also developing and designing together how they could actually answer to global health risks together also on, on the technical side. And one important thing here is what I mentioned earlier, uh, data sharing, uh, cross-border cross border developing, maybe somehow making uh, health data accessible for the stakeholders that may need that data on the specific moment. And if I could add, you know, the telemedicine, the point of care diagnostics, you know, um, delivery systems, they're going to be focused, focused for, you know, years to come. Great. Well, the ticking time bomb that's at the top of my screen tells me that we have about a minute left. Um, uh, is there any final points that I think that I didn't touch upon that people, you know, that, that are people are interested in making as we close out this uh, session? Yeah, I think my, my main taking point uh, from the pandemic is that while the pandemic is, we're still, you know, trying to make our way out of it. There's a lot of silver linings that, you know, show that there's promise in the future for new ways to innovate and new ways to collaborate. Great. I think that's an excellent last word. I'm, I want to thank all of the panelists. I want to thank Horasis for putting this all together. Um, thank you again, uh, all of the participants and the uh, those have, uh, that have uh, participated or have, have been joining, uh, joined us online. And uh, with that, um, I will end this uh, Horasis panel. I look forward to seeing some or many of you in the future on future panels and elsewhere in the healthcare space. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. You, got it. you have 20 seconds so left. You have 20 seconds of your life that I'm giving you back. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>